Amen. And I, I hope that we are here to worship, and I hope and pray that Jesus is enough. And if perchance you would honestly answer that question that no, when you came here this morning, He was not all you needed. You wanted something from Him. I pray that today as you leave, you're able to say honestly from a pure heart, no, He is enough. He is all I need and all I want. I pray that is our, our request of God today. Would you turn with me to 1 Timothy? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10 is where we're going to where we're going to be for the part of our time this morning, but we're going to be switching back and forth because we're we're on a theme. We're talking about a theme. And in a theme, you're not just exegesing, you're not just going verse by verse, word by word through a through a through a passage, you're you're including and pulling in other passages. And so we have to do that. So this morning, again, I'm going to ask you to flip back and forth in your Bible, to have that thing in your hand, ready to go, finger licked, whatever it takes to get those small pages to flip, just be ready to flip. We are in First Timothy chapter six, verses six through ten. And it says this. Now goodness. Sorry. Now good now godliness with contentment is great gain. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and into snare, and into much foolishness and harmful lusts which drowned men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Three days ago, we had this experience in America. It's pretty much only an American holiday. We've been around the world and other places, and no one else understands what Thanksgiving is. Now, they know the word. Every language has this word. Not everyone understands what it means. I think we don't understand what it means. But three days ago, we experienced and celebrated this thing called Thanksgiving. A wonderful time of reflecting back on the blessings over the last year. A time to remember and to say, thank you. Right? We experienced it. I hope you all took part in it. You might have, have taken too much part of it. Right? The turkey, the dressing, the leftover turkey, the dressing... The leftover, leftover turkey sandwiches with dressing. Maybe a little too much thankfulness in that area, but, but how sweet that we experience this. How sweet that America remembers this holiday that we born. Thanksgiving. How needed is it to be thankful and how often forgotten. But this just this past Thursday, Thanksgiving 2023, we celebrated Thanksgiving and then followed it with another holiday. On the very heels of Thanksgiving, we have another holiday. What's the name of this one? Black Friday. So we have this day, this Thanksgiving time where, where we're thankful and we're happy and we remember all that we've been given. We just sit back and bask in the presence of God and saying thank you, Lord, for health, for family, for food, for clothing, for shelter, for freedom. And then we start planning our, our attack on the Black Friday shopping. Which store to go to, how early to get up, where to get the coffee to keep you awake. We start planning this attack on this, this Black Friday event. We don't normally get up before dawn, ever. Maybe, probably, possibly, most often not for the Lord. But for Black Friday, there's special deals. You've got to be there to get them. And so we wake up before dawn. We've got everything planned out. We've got all these things we need and want to be thankful for next year, right, on Thanksgiving. So we go and we purchase and we purchase and we buy and we spend money often we don't have. Put it on a credit card, pay for it later. Black Friday this year was a huge holiday, more, more celebrated than probably Thanksgiving. The numbers aren't out yet, but let me tell you about last year. Last year's Black Friday saw 196 million shoppers in America go out into the streets. I was at Menards on Friday morning, 
not to do Black Friday shopping, to get some plumbing supplies for my son's house, my son-in-law's house. I've never seen so many people in there to buy stuff that I was looking in their cart. I was, I was like, what are, they, what are they getting up before, before the sun comes up to buy? And I saw nothing in there that they couldn't have bought the day before for the same money. But five people fighting, carts bouncing off of each other at Menards on Black Friday morning. I don't understand. We're crazy. 196.7 million shoppers on Black Friday in 2022. 87 more million people did online shopping on Black Friday. Do you realize that we only have 334 million people in America? Men, women, and babies. 334 million. But 196.7 of them were shopping on Friday morning. Can you imagine the craziness of our desire and our want, this greed that we have to buy more stuff. We Americans last year spent $65.3 billion on Black Friday. $65.3 billion. That's to the tune of $567 each. Now you're saying, no, you might not be saying this because you didn't do it, but those heathens that did it, but that's my Christmas presents. I'm buying this for other people, right? Right? This is for other people because it's better to give than to receive, and this is when I save the most money. Don't fool yourself. I heard the the words of the people that were shopping. I saw them. I've I've since read some of the articles. No, no, people go to shop because they love to shop. They don't even need the stuff. They just want to experience the excitement of the fight. It's like salmon swimming upstream. So Black Friday saw 196.7 million shoppers in it. 13% 13% increase from 2021. Probably another 13% of this year. How crazy is it? Does it seem strange to anyone else? I mean, maybe it's just me coming back after some years of not experiencing it. It seems insane that day, the day after Thanksgiving, that we planned this shopping extravaganza, this fighting, this all-out dash to get junk that we don't need. Does it say something about our thankfulness? Does it say something about America's understanding of thanksgiving that the next day we do this? No wonder we're so confused as a nation. It shows that we have a real problem with something. Personal satisfaction. Gratitude. Thanksgiving. If you've spent any time in our world today, like if you're not cloistered away in a little closet somewhere, then you would know that our world has a problem with personal satisfaction. You would say that you yourself, if you're honest, have a problem with personal satisfaction. What you had a month ago, what you bought, it was shiny, it was new, now brings you very little joy. You want something shinier, you want something newer. The new iPhone came out. I gotta go stand in line to get it. The new shoes are out, the new clothes are out, the new car is out, the new TV is out. Whatever's new, it's shiny. We want it, we want more, we want bigger, we want newer, we want better. And I believe it comes from one thing. Hear me, a lack of joy. A lack of joy in Christ. A lack of joy in the the lover of your soul, in your Savior, in the one you should be thankful to, in in the one that died on this cross, the one that we're going to celebrate Christmas, his birth. It's a lack of joy which brings this deep feeling of, of unsatisfaction of not being personally satisfied. It comes from a lack of hope in a future, a lost world that has no idea what hope is. Do you wonder why our world struggles with depression and suicide and death? And Am I a man? Am I a woman? Am I a boy? Am I a girl? Uh, Going into schools and shooting. I mean, why does this stuff happen? It's because there's no hope. It's because there's no joy. It's because there's no future. And all they see is dark blackness similar to a holiday called Black Friday, of just buy and get and hope that it brings me joy, knowing that it will not. In a very short few days, I'm now back to having no hope and no joy, even after I've spent so much money on this thing. See, I remember this feeling. I remember the feeling of, no, of having no hope. Do you remember it? Now, I often ask you, do you remember your salvation? Do you remember the moment? We heard a testimony this morning in Sunday school about salvation and that feeling. It's more than a feeling, but that feeling you get of having the weight of your sins lifted off you. 
just the euphoric, just the revival that takes place in your heart. Do you remember that feeling? Well, next to that, do you remember this, 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 this joy that overtook you? This feeling of hope, of a future coming, and a, mem- and a remembrance of, of, a, of a past that's gone behind you. you. You now no longer have to worry about this past. Do you remember that feeling of the hopelessness? This is what our world struggles with, the feeling of having no hope, no future. So they drown themselves, which is what we just read in this scripture. They drown themselves in destruction. They have distractions, new toys, new things, new, new addictions. Nobody likes to point this out, but, but it's this feeling of hopelessness and a lack of joy that too often causes us to develop all this negative behavior. Everything, by the way, is a disease now, if you've noticed. Alcoholism, disease. Beating your wife, it's a disease. Eating too much, it's a disease. Every sinful issue that the Bible says sin, flee from it, we now categorize it as a disease. disease. And by the way, a disease either has to have a pill or there's no cure. So what do we do? We take pills. We find a cure. Or we live with the fact that, oh, it's a disease, I can't help it. I shop. <laughs> it's a disease, I can't help it. No, no, it's, it's a sin issue, and we must help it. All this negative behavior, I believe, goes back to the idea of, of we have no joy. We have no hope because we have no one to place our hope in. We're speaking and, and thinking about worship, who we worship, about being thankful. It's in Christ and Christ alone where we find our joy, not in your stuff. See, we, we've seen this raise of something called, I, I remember when I first heard this word, binge watching. The person I heard it from was actually saying it like it was a good thing. I've been binge watching some show on Netflix. I was like, binge watching? The only thing I know about binge is binge drinking, and that's a bad thing. Binge watching must be a bad thing. See, we binge watch, we desire entertainment because we lack something of a joy in our Savior. So we search for it in entertainment. We stay up all night watching this show because we don't want to think of our own thoughts in our mind. We don't want to go to sleep with the guilt of no hope. So we distract ourselves. Others might be food. I say that because Thanksgiving just ended. We find satisfaction in the meal that we eat. In the next meal we're going to eat, we look forward to it because there's nothing to look forward to in the minutes between it. I have no joy. I have no hope. There's no worship in my heart, so I have to eat to bring me satisfaction. It's an epidemic, people, in our world today. It's killing us. It's all these addictions that we have. We drink to drown our loneliness, our sadness, only to find out that alcohol just causes more loneliness and sadness. It's a depressant. The holidays, leading time of alcohol around the world. More alcohol is consumed in the holidays than anything, any other time. Black Friday is another way we express our deep longing for joy. Black Friday, this, this, this idea that I need something, I need more junk to hide my depression, my sadness, my hopelessness. We hope that that new thing will bring us the joy we're searching for. Maybe it's a a relationship. I just need to find that new person, that new man, the new woman, the new boyfriend, the new girlfriend to bring me joy, only to find out that, no, it's not them. It's actually you is the problem. You have no joy because you don't know Christ. So we just bounce and keep skipping around from addiction to addiction. Again, I understand it. I get it. When it's in the lost world, I get it. I see it. I understand. But Why is it in here? Why is it among us? Why is it counted among the church of Christ that we deal and fight these same struggles and addictions? Because we don't understand joy. Because we don't understand worship. Why is it in the church? Because we've, we've, we've come to this idea that worship is a thing that we do for a few moments when our mouths are moving and, and some sort of uh, sound is coming out. But it's so much more than that. We've been studying what worship is. Worship is prayer. Worship is reading 
the Word of God. Worship is hearing the Word of God preached. Worship is spending time fellowshipping with each other. Worship is spending time in silence with your Savior. Total silence. Just listening. Just waiting to hear. This is worship. We don't understand what it is, and so we lack joy, we lack hope, and we have no thanksgiving in our heart. I believe it's because we take our eyes off the object of worship. When you take your eyes off Christ and you place them on anything else and worship it, you will not be satisfied. If it's a wife, if it's a child, if it's a grandchild, you will not find satisfaction in that worship. You must keep your focus on Christ and on Christ alone. Too often we forget this and it's to our own detriment. Last week we looked at the reason for Christian worship. Last week in here, we looked at who and how we worship and what worship is not and must be. As Christians, we are called and even commanded to worship. You shouldn't have to be commanded to worship. You shouldn't have to be encouraged to read your word. As a Christian, you should hunger and thirst after righteousness. Is that you, Christian? Follower of Christ, is that you? Do you, do you wake up hungry? Do you go to bed hungry for the word of God? Then there's something missing. There's a lack of joy, a lack of hope, a lack of worship of the Christ, the only one you should focus your worship on. So you had Thanksgiving this past Thursday, and we were all thankful. We were all truly thankful. But what were you thankful for, and who were you thankful to? I would dare say that there is a, there is a movement around our world today and our culture to say, well, I was thankful to the Indians. Right? Were you thankful to the Indians on Thanksgiving? Did you say thank you for teaching them how to plant corn or whatever our history books tells us? No, I hope not. Were you thankful to the pilgrims for bringing the, the, the boats to this new country, setting up this lifestyle that you have? Were you thankful to your family? I hope that's a good thing. Were you thankful to the government? This is not what Thanksgiving is about. It's part of it. It's not less than, but it's certainly more than this. You must be thankful, thanksgiving to the God of creation. That you are a God. That you are a chosen one from the God of creation. That is who you should be thankful for. It's baked into us to be thankful. It's created in a Christian. You must be thankful. Only those who truly see their sinfulness, their self-righteousness, their depravity, will understand thanksgiving. Now, now follow me with this. You cannot possibly be thankful for something you do not know that you have committed. If, you, if, you, if I told you, uh, you were guilty of, of, a, of a large speeding fine. You're guilty. There, there's a ticket in your mailbox, $100,000. You have driven very, very recklessly. That'd make no sense to you, right? You're like, when? Show me the proof. I don't remember doing that. But now if I went back and I showed you the proof, if I showed you, you didn't know that that was a, 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 a zone that you had to go slowly in. You didn't know that it was there. But then I went back and I showed you the video evidence of you doing it. Now you're, you know you're guilty. Now it makes sense. Now the thankfulness of me paying that price for you, that fine for you, makes sense. But before that, you were offended. You can only be thankful when you understand what you're thankful for. I can tell you to be thankful for Christ, but if you don't think you need him, big deal. I can tell you to worship the risen Savior, but if you don't think there's, there's any reason for you to worship, what did he do for me? Big deal. You have to understand what you are thankful for. You have to understand your depravity. You have to understand that you're a sinful creature. Nothing good in us. You probably don't like to hear that, do you? Are you thankful that I said that to you? Is that something you would be thankful for? Thank you, Lord, for showing me my own depravity. You should be thankful for that. It is grace. Young people and old people, every time you get caught doing something stupid, sin, it's grace. Every time you get caught sinning, it's grace. It's God's grace being given to you. You should be thankful for that. Every time you think something and the Lord, the Holy Spirit, causes your mouth to shut, you should be thankful. As a Christian, we are thankful for many things. We're thankful for health. We're thankful for food for safety, for freedom, and yeah, for all the stuff. We're thankful for all that, but 
we understand that all of those things are going to rust, rot, and be ripped off. Read with me, Matthew 6, 19 and 20. All these things that we oftentimes spend our focus on thanking God for are going to rot, rust, and be ripped off. We shouldn't be surprised when the world goes crazy for the new toys that they have. And they're not going to last very long. But they get so excited about it. This is what Matthew chapter 6, 19 and 20 says. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in to steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21, a Thanksgiving verse. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What were you thankful for on Thursday? Whatever came to mind, whatever came out your mouth, that's where your heart is. Is it for family? Wonderful. Is it for food, safety, freedom? Wonderful. It's not less than that, but it's certainly more than that. Where your heart is, your worship will follow. Who is your God? What is your God? What are you thankful for? What are you worshiping? Where do you place treasure and value on life? The true gift of God is nothing monetary. The true gift of God is nothing that you could have in your hand, put in your pocket, or wear on your wrist. That's not a gift of God. That's a part of his creation. But it's not the true gift of God. The true gift of God is salvation. It's his son becoming flesh, dying on a cross for your sin, for the worst of you. That's the true gift of God. Forgiveness. He personally gives you through his blood. This is what we're thankful for. This is what Thanksgiving is. When you clearly see who and what you are before a just and a holy God, you will worship. You will worship. Do you wonder why you've lost that spark? Why you want, do you wonder why you've lost that feeling that you had when you were first saved? Well, why have you lost that spark with your wife? What happened? Probably distance. She's gone this way and I've gone this way and we're just not staring at each other. We're not spending the quality time that we used to. Very same thing in a much larger scale with Christ. When you were saved, you were as close as you could possibly come. He just took all your sin off of you. You are at the foot of the cross. You are bowed down at his feet saying, thank you, Lord. And then in time, you get distracted. In time, you get pulled away by the lusts and the distractions of this world. And you start spending more time with the world, less time with the Word. And pretty soon it's coldness, and you wonder, why am I not thankful? Why do I not have gratitude? Why does my worship seem so cold? It's because you're not spending the quality time and the quantity time with your Savior. First Timothy, verse 6, 6 through 10, again says this, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Are you content with godliness? If all you had was the scripture and the desire to live according to it, would that be considered gain for you? Or do you need something more? The song David just sang. Are you here to get something from Jesus? Are you here to get something from God? Are you here to give something to God? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Are you grateful for salvation? Are you worshiping the God of creation from a heart of thanksgiving? You cannot and you will not worship from an ungrateful heart. Let me repeat that. You cannot and you will not worship if your heart is ungrateful. It's impossible to do. It's like your son that hates green beans telling mom thank you for making him eat green beans. It just doesn't happen. He might voice the words, thank you, mom. I'm about to puke. I know they're making me healthy. But it's not grateful. There's not thanksgiving in his, in his life, in his heart, for doing this. You cannot worship from an ungrateful heart. Thanksgiving always precedes worship. You are thankful. You know who you're thankful to, and you must worship him. It's what we do as Christians. Gratefulness is the beginning of worship. So I ask you, are you grateful? 
Are you grateful to the Lord, to the God of creation? Here's a quote that I want you to think about. I'm going to read it twice for you so that you hear it clearly. Self-pity and gratitude are mortal enemies. Self-pity and gratitude are mortal enemies. Where one exists, the other cannot. Since both are highly contagious, individuals must choose gratitude before coming to thankless to do otherwise. Let me read it again. Self-pity and gratitude are mortal enemies. Where one exists, the other cannot. Since both are highly contagious, individuals must choose gratitude before becoming too thankless to do otherwise. You cannot be both grateful and have self-pity at the same time. It just does not, ex- does not exist. A Christian that, that, is, that is in wallowing in self-pity will not worship the Lord or be thankful for what He's given them. They're looking at all these other things they want, all these other things they feel that they need. Self-pity is, is, is the antonym. It's the opposite, the negative of gratitude, the exact opposite of those two. Self-pity, feeling sorry for yourself, your troubles, your needs, your wants, your problems, that's what self-pity is, and it causes this lack of worship. And it's an epidemic in today's society. It may even be something you struggle with. This idea of I've just, woe is me, I'm so down, I'm so depressed, I have nothing. These feelings only lead you to deeper and deeper bitterness. They're feelings, by the way. It's not a, it's not a mind, it's not a brain problem. It's not a chemical issue. It's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual problem within you. You are being enveloped and just thinking and dwelling upon this negativeness and negativeness and then it becomes bitterness and envy and rage and depression and suicide because of a lack of thankfulness, because of a lack of worship, because of a lack of gratitude. Not only does our nation have this big problem with the lack of thankfulness, but it's, it's, in, it's just an epidemic of abortion. When you, when you listen, when you watch whatever you watch on social media, all you hear is these people saying, I, I need this from the government. I need this from you. I need this from school. I need, I need, I need, I need. Nothing about what they're doing. It's just what they're wanting. It's a problem of woe is me attitude, this attitude of self-pity. Today, it seems popular, even cultural, to say that I need something from you. Do you, do you realize the older generation even when they have needs in this church, they will not ask you to help them? I'm, I'm talking about some of you. <laughs> Even when you have a need, you won't call the church to help you with that need. Today's society, they don't even have a need and they're asking for help. They want this, they want that. Give it to me or I'm angry. You owe it to me. This ungratefulness that is built in us this desire to have more and that everyone owes them something is, is, a, is the root of this sin of ungratefulness, a lack of joy, of no hope. Ungratefulness bends towards self-pity. First you're ungrateful, then, you're, then, you, then you wallow in self-pity. Pretty soon you become anxious. Anger, apathy, depression, disbelief, dislike, disrespect, they continue on for infinity and negatives. It all begins with this ungratefulness. This idea that I need more, I want more, I'm not happy with what I have. I've got curly hair, I want straight. I'm too tall, I want to be shorter. I'm too short, I want to be taller. I'm a guy, I want to be a girl. I'm married to her, I want to be married to her. I've got this job, I want the other job. I've got a blue truck, I want a red truck. Just ungratefulness of what we have. Last Sunday we looked at worship. What and who were to direct our worship to. Worship and gratitude, remember they go hand in hand. So I ask you, are you grateful. On Thursday, were you thankful to God? To God first, did you worship Him in your thankfulness? Was there this little prayer over Thanksgiving and now let's get to the real deal? It's food because there's football to watch pretty soon. Were you worshipful in your your idea of Thanksgiving? Are you thankful today? Are you worshiping today? One leads to the other. If we don't worship, If we won't worship, it's because you don't know the who of what we are to worship. When you know the who, 
you must worship. When you know the Christ of salvation, you will worship. A biblical knowledge of God will cause a response. The preaching of the Word is to, is to give you a biblical knowledge of who God is. The reading of the Word is so that, you, so that you learn to love God more. The more you know of Him, the more you will love Him, or you will hate Him. They do not go together. You cannot love and hate Him. You cannot both know Him and ignore Him. There's one or the other. Which is you today? Second Chronicles 16, 34 and 36 says this. Sorry, First Chronicles 16, 34 through 36 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Can you say amen to these verses as I read them in your mind? Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. And say, save us, O God, for our salvation. Gather us together and deliver us, deliver us from the Gentiles to give us thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Can you thank him and worship him? The scripture is replete with this. It goes on and on and on about who this God is that we serve. Is that you? Are you thankful? Does this look like your life? Do you know of the mercies of God? I'm going to remind you of a, of a story from Luke chapter 17. Ten lepers. Do you remember the story? Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. There's ten men standing at a distance. Lepers could not be near you. It was illegal to be close to a clean person. They must stay off at a distance. Ten lepers cry out, Master, heal us. Let's read it so we get this correctly. It's found in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through... 19, it says this. Now it happened as they went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met he ten lepers, ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Verse 14. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that they went, and as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God, and fell down his face at the feet, giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who return to give glory to God except for this foreigner? And he, Jesus, said to him, Arise and go your way, for your faith has made you well. Do you see what just happened, church? Ten men just received something from God. One was thankful. Ten received healing from a disease that was literally rotting their flesh from their body. Could not be around their family, could not see their grandchildren, could not eat and have meals with anyone but themselves. This, this ragtag group that had no work, had no money, but what was given to them in charity. They were just healed from this. Nine of them said, Whoo, yeah, now I can get back to life. Now I can get back to doing what I want to do. Living my life, enjoying my family, being thankful for the freedom and the, the gifts that I have. Only one. Returned, and what did he do? He fell down at the feet of Jesus and worshiped God. Is this your heart? You've been given so much. You've been, you've been blessed with so much, but have you been saved? If you have been saved, it's much greater than the disease of leprosy. You have been saved from an eternal hell. You have been saved from being the enemy of God to being a child of God, made peace with God. What does that cause you to do? Do you say, thanks, now I can get on with my life, as the nine lepers did, get on back to their business, or are you like this foreigner? Are you drawn? Are you compelled? Must you go and bow down at the feet of Christ and say, glory to God. Praise God for the salvation of my soul. Which one are you today? Are you the Samaritan, the half-breed, this foreigner? Are you self-righteous? Thank you, Jesus. Now I'm moving on. See you when I'm dead.
That's not thankful. That's ungratitude. And it will only lead in a worship of self. Who are you worshiping today? Will you be like this one that came back and laid down at the feet of Jesus? Will you cry out in worship of your Savior? For the church, there's only one response. There's only one response. You must worship and glorify. You must know the joy. You must know the hope in you. But for the other, for the lost, for the world, for the person that has never experienced that, maybe today for the first time this is making sense. Maybe today you're saying, I, I don't know of a joy that passes all understanding. I don't know of a hope of a future. I'm burdened by guilt. I only know of death. I keep searching and finding, trying to get things to make me feel happy in this world, but it's all rot. What, if anything, can make me have joy in my life? This is it. This is the only thing. Only Christ can do it. Only Christ can save you of your sin and give you a worshipful attitude in the heart. This morning I ask you, which are you? Will you worship the risen Savior? Or will you leave here denying Him? The decision is yours. The time is short. This morning is your opportunity to cry out to God, to say, I am a sinner, condemned unclean, but I want to worship you. Forgive me, Father. Say that, and He will, according to His Scripture, He will forgive you. We're going to have a time of invitation right now. It's a time where we in Southern Baptist churches just stand up, and we, we have a moment where we give the opportunity for those who are being challenged by God, convicted by God to do something, for them to do it. Yeah, there's a lot of people watching. There's a lot of people here. But if you're concerned, overly concerned about what they think of you, then you are not nearly as concerned as you should be of what he thinks of you. Will you respond to whatever God is calling you to do today? Would you pray with me? Father, as we come to this point, on your day, in your house, with your people, for your glory, Lord, I pray that everything that is done is for your edification for your worship. Father, that any word spoken, any, any commitment made would be to bring you glory. Father, help us to have a heart of worship. Father, do whatever it takes in our mind, in our heart, in our hard and often prideful lives to be humbled to a point where we can cry out, Father, have mercy on me, unclean. And Father, as you heal, as you forgive, as you save, as you sanctify, and Lord, as you future tense glorify, I pray that we would come and bow down at your feet and worship. Lord, give us a joy unspeakable. Remove self-pity and ungratefulness from our hearts and our lives. Father, pour into us a passion and a hunger to know you and to be thirsty for your knowledge. Father, it is for your glory and for your name we ask these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me?